How's it going? How are you? Um, delighted to be here tonight. Ken O'Sullivan is my name. Um, I'm a wildlife documentary filmmaker, and I'm very privileged to spend a lot of my time in the ocean, in and around. Uh, I suspect, like many people here tonight, I'm mesmerized about the beautiful oceans and the underwater world and the coastlines that we have in Ireland, which we're very lucky to have. When I was about 10 or 11 years old and I just got the fishing bug, most things were things that got in the way of me being on the rocks at Phoenix Island in County Kerry, which is where my father came from, as an, our ancestral home since 1750. And I can still recall being 10 or 11 years old coming towards the shore on the back of my uncle's tractor with my fishing rod. And there was one word that I dreaded, and that was the word swell. And it's difficult to say th there was an emotional transference in the word when my father said it, that I understood of all the people that had drowned on that island. And many people here tonight might have done Speg Sayers' book in school, and we understood all the people that drowned on the Blasket Islands. Because ancient coastal communities in Ireland were wonderful at surviving on the coast. I found shell middens on the Clare coast that had been dated to 6,000 years ago. And these people became expert fishermen, if only on a subsistence scale. But getting into the sea, into the sea, was something they didn't do well, they couldn't do. And so I believe we live in a time of great fortuity then in that regard, thanks in no small part to uh, something called neoprene, which is the basis of wetsuits. Neoprene was invented by the genius American chemist Wallace Carruthers in the late 1920s. And it allows people like me and so many people to get into the sea. I'm not the world's greatest swimmer, but I can go a kilometer offshore. I'm quite comfortable to do that, and I'm happy to do that, because it gives me buoyancy and it protects me. And I think it's one of the great tragedies. Sadly, Wallace Carruthers took his own life at the age of 37 because he felt he'd betrayed the core values of chemistry. If only he could have seen the joy that he brought to so many millions of people in the world and that he'll continue to do. I think the advancement of camera technologies in the last few years has allowed us to get into the underwater world and as well as exploring it, to document it. And our series on TG Carr and RTE have been basically the first series on Irish television to document the underwater wildlife world around Ireland extensively. So what's so great, you might ask, about the seas in Ireland? Well, we have what we call temperate seas, which are the most fertile seas in the world. And it's basically decided by the latitude that we're at on the planet. So we get lots of storms in the winter, and we get 17 hours of sunlight in the summertime. Now, don't throw anything at me. I said sunlight rather than sunshine. But that basically uh, facilitates the fertility of all the animals that live in there. Uh, for example, we've got 24, just to reduce it to numbers, we have 24 species of whales and dolphins in Irish waters. Minky whales, humpback whales, fin whales, blue whales, the largest creature ever to have lived on planet Earth, 30 metres long, that's 100 feet in old money, live in Irish waters. Absolutely incredible. We've got 40 species of shark, 30 species of skates and rays, thousands of species of uh, jellyfish, not to mention fish and invertebrates. D don't take my word from it. I'm going to show you a short video um, from our ser RT series last year, Ireland's Ocean. It's about one of my favourite creatures, jellyfish. We'll uh, have a look at this. It's about three minutes long and I'll continue. Irish waters are home to some half dozen species of jellyfish, with moon jellies being the most common. Recent years have seen a big increase in all jellyfish numbers, which scientists attribute to the decline of their main predators, tuna and sea turtles. They feed on plankton and other tiny creatures, which they paralyze with their stinging tentacles. But these tiny fish are unaffected by the blue jelly sting. They have a mutual arrangement, cleaning the animal in return for food and protection. Moon 
jellyfish spend the winter as polyps on the seafloor. By early summer, the polyps multiply by dividing themselves into new separate creatures before developing into fully formed adults. High summer off the Kerry coast, and moon jellyfish have gathered here in their thousands with only one thing in mind. Females are carrying thousands of orange eggs. Males release their sperm into the water. By pulsating over it, the females absorb the sperm through their mouths. Once fertilized, the females release their larvae into the plankton. There they remain until they drop to the seafloor to develop into polyps and begin their cycle of life once again. Thank you very much. So how does the sea affect us in Ireland and everywhere in the world? Well, almost all of, in Ireland, almost all of our weather systems originate in the North Atlantic. Uh, as far as I understand it, almost all of our fresh water comes via rain, the rain cycle from the ocean. Half of our oxygen comes from phytoplankton, tiny little creatures that live in the surface of the ocean waters. I think it's been wonderful in recent years in Ireland to see a huge surge in the amount of people getting into the ocean. So things like surfing, kayaking, scuba diving, free diving, you know, it's been a huge boon to that. And I live in Lehinch on the west coast, and it's not that long ago that on the 1st of September, Lehinch more or less closed down, and it opened up again on Whit Weekend the following June. If you wanted to get a pint during the week, any time in the winter months, forget it, there was nothing going on. If you said to a B&B owner or a Republican 10 or 15 years ago, here's an acti activity that the worse the weather, the more people that will come here, they'd ask you where you got the pint. It's just been a boon to things. So now we have the, uh, every weekend the town is full of people. There's a tourism benefit, benefit to the local community and many other spin off benefits to it. As a filmmaker, I spend much of my time in the ocean trying to document these wonderful creatures. But I'm also very interested to see what people's response is to the ocean. What do we feel when we see a dolphin? What do we feel when we see a shark? It's interesting to see how people react to that. The Greek philosophers had a saying that said, nihil est in intellectu quod prius in sensu. There's nothing in our intellect that didn't originate in our senses. And to me, it's very important what our reaction is when we come across, when we see the ocean and how we feel to it. Uh, I'm going to show a little sequence uh, that we filmed with blue sharks off the coast of Cork a couple of years ago. Again, this is from our RT series last year. Uh, and if I can master this technology. We are about 20 miles southwest Cork, and we have a lovely conditions today. We just got the first blue sharks in the water. Pretty excited. Hopefully, we're gonna get more and uh, get in the water and try to swim with them. Hopefully, we get more sharks. So. Sharks are not dangerous if you keep respect and um, if you give them space. They're just mellow animals, beautiful looking mellow creatures. I used to be scared from sharks. Every animal on this planet, once you spend the time with them, you learn how to approach them, how to behave, you learn about their behavior, so you know their body language. 
that's the main thing which we should know about animals before we try to approach them. After years swimming in the sea, I can say I'm not afraid of sharks. That impression which we have from American movies, it gave us wrong picture of the sharks. They're actually afraid of us. They don't want to attack us. Thank you very much. Cheers. I mean, I should honestly add, you know, sharks aren't cuddly teddy bears, and obviously that piece is taken slightly out of context of an overall documentary. But when we shot that scene off the coast of Cork about two years ago with George, uh, you know, we were some of the first people to, in Ireland to swim with toothed sharks. Lots of people have swum with basking sharks who are, you know, more or less harmless. Um, and the truth is that there are no records in Ireland of anybody ever being attacked by a shark in the water. There's none. And yet 99% of people, if they're in the water or anywhere near it, if they heard about a shark, they'd run, screaming and kicking and swim. Why? Because based on what we know about these animals, it triggers a reaction in us. And in that case, the reaction is a life-saving one. And it's just what we know isn't right. I think the current estimate is that humans are killing between 70 and 100 million sharks globally every year. Every year. Sharks are, have been around for 450 million years. And in that time, they've evolved into an apex predator. Now, what that means, or what scientists call a keystone species. What does that mean? It means they're at the top of the food chain, and then they effectively become a regulator of the food chain. So they keep a lot of fish populations in check, so that the fish populations don't overexpand and destroy crucial habitats, like coral reefs, that kind of thing. Buddhists say everything is connected. There's an old Irish saying, Maran Nadini Lishkela People live in each other's shadow. What does that mean for us? The story of sharks is an example of how nature's balance, a balance that's come in the natural world over tens or hundreds of thousands of years, and in some cases millions of years, has basically been put out of kilter. And the disastrous consequences aren't just for the sharks, they're for the ecosystems and ultimately for the humans. As I said earlier, half of the oxygen on our planet comes from phytoplankton, tiny little creatures that live in the surface waters. And you might think, well, that's great, and I hope those guys stay healthy, and hopefully they will. Phytoplankton are at the other end of the food chain from sharks, but they are the foundation of the ocean food chain. Larger plankton, zoo pl zooplankton feeds on them, small fish feeds on that, bigger fish feed on them, sharks feed on them, up through the food chain. In some cases, whales and basking sharks feed on the plankton. Why the phytoplankton are so, such a, a value to the food chain? They convert, they photosynthesize carbon and light into food energy. Now, as a byproduct almost of that reaction, they create oxygen. It's pretty convenient for us, half of the world's oxygen. Now we have a problem. All of the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere, large amounts of that is getting into the ocean. When it hits seawater, it causes a chemical reaction that changes the pH balance of seawater. This is called ocean acidification. Now, scientists don't know the true extent of it yet, but at a very simple level, that's what's happening. So you say to yourself, well, what's going to happen to the oxygen? <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. There's no easy answer. The only answer I know is that education and awareness are hugely important. And schemes like the Untashka uh, uh, Cleaner Coast and the education unit and the kind of work that we do. In the 1970s, British nuclear fuels went out to the deep ocean and repeatedly dumped tens of thousands of tons of nuclear waste. Now, lots of countries did it, but British nuclear fuels, for some reason, did many multiples of anybody else. And they did it because they thought the ocean is so big, so vast, so deep, it may as well be another planet. And here's a convenient way to get rid of this. We'll never see this again. Tomorrow, I'm going out on the Celtic Explorer, which is the Irish National Research Vessel, with some incredible scientists. And we're going out into the deep ocean. And they have a remotely controlled submersible that they can put down to 3,000 meters. And not alone does it have cameras, it can take samples of the ecosystems. And these guys will spend months and years preparing for that trip, and months and years afterwards digesting and processing what they find. And because they've been there already, they know a lot of the stuff that they can expect. Cold water coral reefs, 3,000 meters deep, 
This has a massive effect on the entire ecosystems, where once we thought there was no life and darkness, they're finding fish spawning grounds. What happens there? Predators come and eat the fish. What happens? Bigger fish eat them, and I've already said it. It's the same thing. It goes right up the food chain. Remember, ultimately, we're not just trying to save the planet. We're trying to save ourselves. We're blessed with beautiful, fertile, life-giving oceans. And I really do hope we can keep them that way. Thank you very much. <laughs>